here from Paul. Uh, Paul received a, a BA in Botany and Zoology from University of Wisconsin and a PhD in Ecology uh, from Duke University where he worked for uh, uh, Gabby Catull. Uh, he also served as a research associate at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and uh, is currently an assistant professor at Montana State University. And uh, he's going to be talking this week about uh, some of the results from the FluxNet network and, and more. So uh, Paul, thank you for uh, agreeing to this. And go ahead. Stephen, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm going to talk about evapotranspiration observations from medical variants. And I'm going to focus on uh, Thinking about water flux also in terms of energy flux, discuss the surface energy balance. For many people here, this might all be too basic. I, I hope um, it's not boring. And then uh, get into a little bit of the theory of eddy covariance, as well as some applications that may or may not be interesting. And then we're going to follow this up with a with a quick derivation of the peman monteith equation for evapotranspiration. The goal for all of this is to explain eddy covariance and thinking about it from a hydrological perspective. Um, for the purpose of making eddy covariance a, uh, I, I guess, just more applicable to hydrology than it oftentimes is. So we oftentimes think um, about can the. Can I just interrupt one second? Sorry no about problem. that. Can you do like a, a presentation mode of the slide? Sure, that works. And that would be bigger. Okay, how's that? I uh, just wait. Perfect. That's much better. All right. Great. Thank you. So many people um, here often think about the ecosystem water balance, where we have precipitation that's measured using tipping buckets or other rain gauges. There's also a stem flow in forest to think about the through fall, um, which is that precipitation is not intercepted by the plant, and that intercepted water might be evaporated. There's also evaporation from soil. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer or not. And then water that goes through a plant into the atmosphere, of course, is transformation. We can use sap flow or leaf level measurements to measure that. Um, and you, we can use eddy covariance to measure the sum of those two terms, evaporation plus transpiration equals evapotranspiration. Now, of course, what is left over is available to change the amount of water in the soil, soil changes in storage, as well as any overland and or groundwater flow, which we'll call Q. Uh, but instead of thinking about the ecosystem water balance, I want to take a step back and think instead about the global energy balance um, and use these connections between the energy and water to help motivate our understanding of surface atmosphere exchange of water. So if we have instant solar radiation, this incoming solar constant, the solar constant divided by four, uh, 341.3 watts per meter squared, it varies a little bit right, due to the energy output by the sun. Um, a little bit's reflected by clouds in the atmosphere, a little bit's reflected by the surface. A lot of it's absorbed by the surface. That absorbed energy is available to evaporate water via evapotranspiration. And then that energy is then re-released into the atmosphere once the water is condensed and forms precipitation. It also drives sensible heat fluxes, thermals, right, heat exchange from the surface to the atmosphere. And of course, evapotranspiration is also a heat flux because it takes energy to evapotranspire water. Um, because the surface is at some temperature, because of the Stefan-Boltzmann law, it is also irradiating energy back out. Some of that energy just goes right through the atmosphere, through this so-called atmospheric window. Most of it is, is absorbed by the atmosphere and is either re-radiated re back to the surface or radiated out into space. And those that balance of energy is what determines the global temperature. So I mentioned a couple topics already, right? That very fundamental physics that if you're a photon, you can be either absorbed or reflected or transmitted as a function of your wavelength and the material at hand, be it the atmosphere, the surface, what have you. Um, and when we're talking about the global energy balance, of course, we are ta thinking mostly about shortwave radiation that's coming from the sun. Uh, it has some, right, d defined by, um, by Planck's law, some characteristic distribution. With a peak in the visible ranges, of course, ultraviolet radiation is extremely important. And ozone, if you're looking down uh, a few subplots, is absorbing that energy and re-radiating it. Uh, 
as we get toward the long wave radiation that the surface is emitting back in the atmosphere and eventually out into space, you can see where this atmospheric window resides, right? That is energy that is going, being transmitted straight to the atmosphere. But most of it, again, is absorbed, and uh, especially by water vapor, which will always be the most important greenhouse gas. And because energy is a function of wavelength, right? These short wave radiation, the photon in the short wave bands is more energetic than one in the long wave bands. And for these reasons, including the lifetimes, of these gases that absorb long wave radiation in the atmosphere, they have a di different effective uh, greenhouse gas equivalents. We oftentimes like to think of them, right? Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas, but also a little bit of methane goes a long way because it's absorbing more energetic parts in the spectrum and uh, depending on the compound has different atmospheric lifetimes. This figure's from bartbellamyclimate.com. I don't know anything else about this page except that that's, this image is one of the very few that I've seen that really captures so much in terms of the global energy balance and takes some fundamentals and, and translates them into something that I feel is understandable. <clears throat> so what, what we need to think about, right, if we're talking about coupling between the water, water balance and the energy balance is that evapotranspiration is that term that enters both of those equations. So as we mentioned before, right, we have a water balance, which is precipitation equaling evapotranspiration plus runoff plus drainage plus storage. And as we'll go into in detail in the next few slides, the energy balance is evapotranspiration plus sensible heat flux plus any energy flux into the soil or other parts of an ecosystem also photosynthesis because you uh, we did not get carbon fixed for free right because of the photosynthetic machinery that is requiring photons and energy to occur those terms together equal the net radiation which itself equals the amount of instant short wave minus outgoing short wave radiation right that is reflected back um, to the atmosphere plus any instant long wave radiation from the atmosphere minus any outgoing long wave radiation so uh, thinking about this energy flux term, uh, we can write the, the part that's over to the right, the net radiation equals instant short wave minus outgoing short wave plus instant long wave minus any outgoing long wave. And that also equals this evapotranspiration plus sensible heat flux plus soil and ecosystem heat flux is other things that are changing that are requiring energy to change the heat content of an ecosystem plus any photosynthesis, although we typically th t tend to think that that term is minor on the order of a couple percent. In some cases, like uh, corn and maize, the C4 crop, it can be upwards of 10% of the energy on the surface is going to fix carbon. Um, so to bring these things together, right? we, we, we like to measure model understand evapotranspiration using the eddy-covariance technique. And to do so, it's critical to keep these other terms of the energy balance in mind. And that'll become clear later. So let's take one maybe more step back or maybe a step forward and think about the fundamental equations that we use to understand and, and really define evapotranspiration and sensible heat flux. And these laws come from Ohm's law. Voltage equals some current times some resistance. Or we can rearrange that and think of a flux of current equals some difference in voltage, right? a gradient in voltage, divided by a resistance or a voltage times a conductance. Right? Resistance is the inverse of conductance. We can think of resistors and conductors in the same way. And we use that as a basis for modeling surface atmosphere exchange because sensible heat flux and latent heat flux can be expanded using Fourier's law and Fick's law. We have a flux of sensible heat or of latent heat. That is a function of some resistance. Now that rho and Cp, that is the density and specific heat of air for unit considerations. Right, we have a resistance. In this case, both of those resistances are in seconds per meter to give uh, energy flux in watts per meter squared. And um, a gradient, in the case of sensible heat flux, a gradient um, in temperature between the surface and the atmosphere, 
and in the case of latent heat flux, a gradient between um, water vapor concentration between the surface and the atmosphere. Uh, actually, this I just reminded myself, and apologies for confusion for people who are used to looking at these things, these two equations were copied from a talk I gave a couple of days ago about the energy balance of snow, where we're talking about a positive flux going into the snowpack. These, such that I have air temperature minus surface temperature, is typically surface temperature minus air temperature, such that a positive flux is going from surface to atmosphere of all these terms. And when it comes to those conventions, be it positive or negative, what is important is your frame of reference. Is energy entering the atmosphere? Is energy entering snow? Right. One simply needs to keep track of uh, that basis for getting the correct combination of positive and negative fluxes into or out of some quantity. Um, this is a busy slide, and I'm giving it to you for reference because so far we've been talking about energy fluxes in watts per meter squared. And a watt per meter squared is also a joule per meter squared per second. Or the definition of a watt is a joule per second. And um, if we take the, right, and so that's this latent heat, right, lambda E. Why lambda? Uh, lambda is the latent heat of vaporization. And we can think also of evapotranspiration in mass flux units, right, such that evapotranspiration and mass flux times the latent heat of vaporization, the energy required to evaporate that mass is how you can perform a conversion between mass flux and energy flux. For hydrologic considerations, right, we can also take this energy flux and convert it to a velocity, a depth per time, um, meters per second of evaporation by taking joules per meter squared per second, dividing by the latent heat of vaporization, dividing by the density of water, resulting in energy fluxes in a depth unit. Um, conductance, right, I, I mentioned before that the resistances that we were talking about were seconds per meter. Uh, we can multiply a conductance in meters per second times the density of air, in this case moles per meters cubed, and come up with conductance also as a flux unit a quantity per area per time. Definitions, for example, of um, the density of water, density of air, latent heat of vaporization, a few resources. So uh, not the most exciting slide, but one maybe um, that you might want to come back to if, in practice, needing to convert from mass to energy to depth per time units. <clears throat> OK, so now on to eddy covariance. And how we're thinking about the transport of heat and water vapor from surface to atmosphere. Um, we're going to consider an imaginary box above an ecosystem. This is a slide from Dave Hollinger. This is a slide that didn't render quite correctly when I sent the PowerPoint over to Kwasi. Uh, so right, we have our ecosystem. In this case, those might be spruces or something, um, maybe firs. Uh, and then we have some imaginary box. Okay, Things can go into and out of all sides of the box. But what we're really concerned with is trying to understand and use this concept to figure out how much of a quantity is going from surface to atmosphere or from atmosphere to surface. So how does that look like an equation form? Right, The flux of something from the surface to atmosphere is defined as the mass balance within that control volume. So we have right this first term, any lateral advective flows. Okay, We have wind moving things. This is going to be CO2, this delta C, but you can also think of that as water vapor, for example. Um, right, plus any turbulent transport along the lateral walls of this box in all directions. And then we're also going to have vertical advection, right? the transport out of or into the top of the box in, in, in terms of mass flow, and also turbulent exchange, right? all of these little eddies that are moving things beyond this box boundary in a turbulent sense. Whoops, and by doing that, I kicked myself out. So, um, so we have turbulence across the sides of the box, turbulence across the top of the box, and also any changes of storage of that quantity within this imaginary volume. And this is a long equation. However, it simplifies, right? Do we need 
under many circumstances, especially during the day, is what coming into, advecting into this side of the box and out of that side, are those, is that mass about the same? Do we even, is there even any net turbulent flux laterally into and out of this ecosystem? Um, and hopefully, is there any, right, a vertical wind velocity ideally is about zero on average. Do we have any advective flows into or out of our box? And the assumption that the eddy covariance system makes is that no, we don't. We can estimate or approximate this flux into or out of this control volume by considering only vertical turbulent transport and any change in storage in that volume. So the eddy covariance, or the vertical covariance of that quantity plus any changes of storage within that quantity is sufficient under the right conditions to estimate the surface atmosphere flux of that quantity. Now, this gets us into maybe hopefully some more basics, and I hope again that I'm not boring people, but what is this W prime, C prime? Um, and, and, and what does that mean? I'd like to define this briefly. Uh, let's consider any time series. Right. Any time series can be defined as the mean plus or minus any deviations from that mean. So in other words, we can reconstruct this time series. It can be turbulence measured on time scales of hertz. In this case, it's mean wind speed measured in time scales of half hours. That much is less important. What's more important is that that time series A is defined as the mean plus any deviations from the mean in the positive or negative directions. And we're getting toward covariance. Let's start with the variance of that time series A. The variance of the time series A is the mean, and that's that overbar. That overbar is the mean of A prime, A prime. It's the sum of the squared deviations. And this is why. The definition of variance is 1 divided by the number of samples times the sum of the difference from every point minus the mean squared. And so what is this equation over here on the right-hand side? It is defined as right every difference minus the mean times every difference minus the mean, i.e., squared. And we take the mean of that with that overbar, 1 over n. So the variance of A is the mean of A prime, A prime. Um, we also, right, when we're thinking about interacting terms, have to think of the mean and the covariance. So the mean of time series A times, times time series B is the mean of each quantity independently plus deviations from A times deviations from B and the mean of that quantity. Now, the important thing is that although this term here, right, on the, the first term on the right-hand side might equal zero, the second term need not, even if this one does. And that we can convince ourselves that this is, in fact, the covariance of this term by considering the definition of covariance. Again, deviations, every uh, observation of A minus the mean value, every observation of B minus the mean value, multiply those by each other, divided by the length of the time series, 1 over n, the covariance. So mean and covariance. <coughs> a slightly busier figure, but this explains, I, I hope, any covariance. This is a figure from Ray Looning at CSIRO. Here now we have deviations in the vertical wind velocity w. We have a mean wind velocity that we hope is around zero in order to satisfy that requirement that we can't have vertical advection from our control volume. And then deviations from that mean due to the impacts of turbulence. And a situation where an outgoing W that I'm kind of highlighting here, right, W going up is associated in this case, this is the mole fraction of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere going down. So in other words, a pulse of air going up that is bringing less CO2 than its surroundings. This would be an event that is consistent with uptake of carbon from the surface, i.e. photosynthesis. And because of the function of stomata, stomata are opening to take up the carbon and losing water. 
one might assume that the corresponding time series of the uh, water vapor would look somewhat the opposite. But what we can do in any covariance right, is perform that operation, assume that the mean W is zero, again, not always the case, but most oftentimes a safe assumption, and have this quantity, right, the, um, this, this flux out of the top of the box, equal to this covariance term, eddy covariance. Right? How um, a concentration of a gas is covarying with the vertical wind velocity under those assumptions that that is the important term when calculating the surface atmosphere exchange of that quantity, keeping also in mind any changes in storage below your sensors. And here are those sensors that we use to measure eddy covariance. We have a sonic anemometer, and we have different infrared gas analyzers that can be used to measure CO2 or water vapor or methane or other things that absorb in the thermal infrared, right, per that figure that we started with, those same physics that are keeping the surface warm due to the greenhouse effect are also those that we're using to quantify at very high frequencies, right? We need to consider every little eddy, hopefully, that is transporting water from the surface to the atmosphere, transporting carbon from the atmosphere to the surface, or vice versa. Um, right? We can use those absorption spectra to make the measurement in the first place. Uh, so we can either suck air from near our sonic anemometer that we're using to calculate the vertical wind velocity and turbulence, or we can have an open pass sensor that's measuring the CO2 or water vapor, et cetera, concentrations very close by, directly in the atmosphere. So because we're trying to measure every little eddy, but we can't measure them all, um, we need to think about that those little tiny eddies, the little wiggles of air probably aren't transporting very much because it, we, it's hard to measure in the same path both the velocity and the, um, and the CO2 or water vapor concentration. Um, strictly speaking, and this is a side, in the side, you can actually couple these two things, but I think that a company that no longer exists uh, has the, um, has has the copyright or not the copyright right, the the patent to do so. So um, maybe in the future there might be more sensors that are can bring the infrared gas analyzer and the sonic anemometer even closer, so that this distance between them is even smaller. So we're not missing any eddy that is smaller than that characteristic distance. So. These eddies that we're using as our vector to understand what's happening at the surface by making measurements in the atmosphere right, is that critical thing that is integrating the effect of every plant leaf stomata in our ecosystem, every puddle of water, every piece of soil, every moist surface that might be evaporating. And so that, right, those things are coming together, being brought, integrated by turbulence, being transported somehow to our eddy covariance instrument, which has uncertainty. The transport has uncertainty as well. And what results is some kind of characteristic eddy covariance flux footprint that varies as a function of wind speed and direction, as well as how much um, uh, sensible heat flux there is, i.e., because um, right, buoyancy flux, right? So, so, so because the surface is warm and because warm air rises and because that is sensible heat, sensible heat would tend to make this footprint reside closer to our instrumentation. Other things would conspire to make it further along. And this is actually originally a movie, but this is just one snapshot of one time in 2005 during a sunny summer day of three ecosystems in the Duke Forest that we've worked on for some time. Um, and uh, right, characterizing where the flux is coming from, coupling eddy covariance and sap flux right, with some papers, for example, Oishi et al. 2008, um, trying to partition fluxes uh, that we'll talk about a little bit more later. Right? It's, it's, I'm going to talk discuss exactly how important it is to understand evaporation and transpiration separately, not just these combined evapotranspiration measurements that are easier to make. Um, interpret patterns in the time series, characterize the uncertainty of these observations, 
find ways to make sure that if we can make a measurement every half hour to hour, right, if we're going to integrate all of those little eddies and choose an averaging time of about half hour an hour to understand the diurnal patterns in fluxes, um, what kinds of quality control steps need to be made. And what these figures are over here, the 75 percent, 50, that, that's just the amount of that footprint area within that. So, so the red, um, that red ellipsoid type thing is the 75 percent flux footprint. In other words, we think that about 75 percent of what we're measuring during that half hour is coming from that source area. <clears throat> okay, so so now, right, we had some eddy covariance basics, and, and now we'd like to maybe think about some science. So in this particular case, we have ecosystems that are adjacent. They're meant to represent ecological succession from agricultural abandonment in this old field ecosystem to this uh, early successional fast-growing loblolly pine forest all the way to this um, mature oak and hickory dominated quote unquote climax ecosystem in the southeastern United States in this hardwood site, how do fluxes of water, carbon, and other things um, differ along ecological succession? And how do these different ecosystems respond differently to climate events? So what we can do with eddy covariance is um, try to understand right, diurnal, seasonal, annual, interannual differences in the amount of, for example, evapotranspiration from these ecosystems. Now, this is latent heat exchange, as we've discussed, that we've converted to the um, de depth of water over time, specifically a year in this case, with some uncertainty. Right? Uncertainty analysis is a different topic, but we can um, characterize the amount of water that's lost from these different ecosystems and, as I'll show in the next slide, why. So in this grass field, right, we had a pretty severe drought in all ecosystems in 2002. The grasses were mowed, never really recovered. Uh, right, the carbon uptake potential was lost. There was not as much evapotranspiration because there was less transpiration in these dead grasses. Uh, the pine forest was also rather sensitive. Right? We had an isohydric species here that is um, closing its stomata in response to increases in the vapor pressure deficit from surface to atmosphere and um, right, being sensitive to the severe drought that we had over these two years. This right here, that snowflake is an ice storm. I'll talk less about that. Rather, that this hardwood forest is kind of doing the same thing, right? A slightly deeper rooted system in a slightly lower area that received um, a little bit of moisture from the pine site. But also, because of differences in phenology, right, you can see that the hardwood site is leafing out. The evapotranspiration is occurring later. There's a hard clay pan under these sites. And so once the pine forest had used all of its water toward the end of the year, there was still some available for the hardwood forest. So the combination of edaphic vegetation conditions resulted in a situation where the hardwood forest was still evapotranspiring about as much when there was a drought versus when there wasn't a drought. Right? It's kind of a conservative water, or just a very rather invariant water use strategy on an annual basis. So this is all well and good, right? We can understand how vegetation impact impacts evapotranspiration, also climate. And because this eddy covariance technique, right, we can put our eddy covariance sensors, measure our microbiological variables that we're using to help understand the flux, and do so worldwide, and um, try to combine all of these measurements. And we've done that, right? There's the Ameriflux network in the United States. There used to be Carbo Europe. Now it's transitioning into something called ICOS. Uh, also in the United States, there's still Ameriflux. And NEON, that we'll talk about later, has started to enter the fray, as everybody's, I'm sure, familiar with. And, you know, Ozflux and other networks as well that people have compiled into a global network called FluxNet, which has some 500 eddy covariance sites, although those aren't publicly available quite yet. Those that are available are over 250 sites. So we can understand how different plant functional types and different climate zones in response to extreme events, in response to normal events, in response to, in the case of Harvard Forest, getting on probably 25 years of measurements, right, how, in that case, actual forest succession is impacting hydrology.
and there are many opportunities to use this, these data which are publicly available. Um, and it's kind of an imperative that we do so from the modeling perspective as well because uh, this shouldn't say from before, I, I ch changed the order of things around. What this figure is showing is the average monthly latent heat exchange, I'm calling that LE in this case, in the North American Carbon Program site level interim synthesis. So you can already recognize a problem, right? A number of these so-called model bake-offs and other things are emphasizing carbon, sometimes at the expense of trying to understand water fluxes from the surface to atmosphere. Most eddy covariance research involves the carbon cycle, less so evapotranspiration, even less so um, the energy balance and sensible heat fluxes. So uh, a number of um, papers arose from these studies, but the take home point here is that if this black dotted line is the mean of 47 different sites in North America with respect to their latent heat exchange on a monthly basis, uh, that's sort of average latent heat exchange on a monthly basis. And these are all of the model outputs. You see models that are absolutely missing aspects of phenology. You see models that are clearly overestimating the amount of latent heat exchange. And you see models that are probably doing pretty good, although it's not clear if they're doing that for the wrong, for the wrong reasons or if the average amongst all these 47 different sites from the tundra all the way down to in the south of Florida are, um, in fact, being captured correctly. And this is an important challenge from the surface atmosphere exchange community, and the challenge for the eddy covariance community to ensure that our eddy covariance measurements are the best they can be is to better understand this issue of energy balance closure that a number of people have studied, written a number of papers about. This is one from a paper that we wrote a few years ago in Ag and Forest Met, demonstrating that across 180 eddy covariance sites, we have about 83% energy balance closure. What does that mean? The available energy, the net radiation minus the soil heat flux, is almost always more than the evapotranspiration plus the sensible heat flux, i.e. the turbulent fluxes, and these um, metabolic or other ener ecosystem energy storage terms that we tend to assume are zero because we're not really measuring them. Um, a number of sites, as you can see, have closed energy balances. A number of sites understand why. And there are different explanations for this lack of closure um, that I won't get into today, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss in more detail should those questions arise. Long story short, um, many sites, right, with the newer eddy covariance instrumentation have better energy balance closure. And um, once, you're, once we add up all of these smaller energy flux terms, we're getting 90% or 95% or greater energy balance closure, which quite frankly isn't that bad knowing that we're missing some of those extremely tiny fluxes, which actually don't transport a lot of water or heat, um, but also a lot of these larger atmospheric motions that are importantly transporting things. But if we have averaging intervals that are too long, two hours or more, we can't understand the diurnal cycle, right? how sensible heat and latent heat uh, net radiation, et cetera, are responding to the diurnal course of um, radiation. So other things to think about. The reason the models aren't working is, in my opinion, a need to understand better the role of biology in constraining latent heat exchanges. So if this was that um, fixed law equation from before, right, we have resistance to water vapor flux, and then some difference in the um, water vapor concentration between the atmosphere and the surface. Again, these two things should be switched. This is for the snow energy balance, not for surface atmosphere exchange. Um, but you know, if this is the vapor pressure deficit over here, and we can plot every single eddy covariance observation that was made in this, this earlier version of the FluxNet database, the so-called the TWIL database, um, Right, look at over 8 million data points and find that, yes, latent heat exchange is increasing as a function of vapor pressure deficit, and then plants are closing their stomata, perhaps optimally, 
perhaps not, right, in response to vapor pressure deficit. In other words, they are decreasing the conductance of the surface because if the atmosphere is dry and there's not a lot of water around, the plants would like to conserve that water. <clears throat> um, other opportunities, right? We, if we need a process level understanding, if the drivers of transpiration are similar to and different from those of evaporation, namely plants can close their stomata, uh, we would like to have an estimate of transpiration and evaporation by themselves, not with respect to uh, just only evapotranspiration all of the time. So we, um, there's an interesting approach from Todd Scanlon and Bill Kustis, as well as an earlier paper by Todd Scanlon and, and his grad student Sahu in 2008 that's trying to use these high frequency turbulence data to partition evaporation and transpiration directly from the high frequency eddy covariance observations. It's an approach that works in shorter statured ecosystems because those smaller eddies are the ones that are transporting more uh, of the exchange between the surface and the atmosphere. And if we have our familiar approaches for understanding what's transpiration, what's evaporation, right, leaf level measurements and trying to scale those up to the ecosystem scale, sap flux observations, some stable isotopic techniques, um, what Scanlon and Kousis are arguing is that if you have a theoretical eddy of air that is only interacting with an open stomata, you have a difference between deviations in water vapor flux and CO2 concentrations that is a line, the slope of which is the water use efficiency. If you have an imaginary eddy that is in no way, shape, or form interacting with any stomata at all and is only capturing evaporation, we have right this QE for evaporation. Every deviation above the mean here means more respiration, so positive carbon fluxes as well. You get a line like that. In reality, there is some offset between this stomatal exchange and this situation of only evaporation. And you can use that to understand and quantify how much water transport is going through stomata, i.e. transpiration, and how much is not, i.e. evaporation. And it's an exciting technique that um, I think should be developed further in the interest of understanding processes. So uh, I guess this brings about a question. I was supposed to go for about 40 minutes, and I'm already starting to get there before even um, deriving the pem monteith equation. Do you think I should just quickly go for it? It'll take about 10 minutes. Yeah, so, you can uh, keep going. We have we have until four o'clock or so. So yeah, go ahead. Well, okay. Well, I'd like I'd like to I mean not not delay, but I'd also like to do this briefly. So, um, so right, what what's actually driving evapotranspiration? Um, it's a chemical potential gradient. So you have a diabatic process, some energy used to drive evaporation, and that is simultaneously setting up a gradient, a diffusion gradient, so that water molecules are diffusing away right, from an area of high concentration and low concentration. So this combination of diabatic and adiabatic processes are theoretically what's causing evapotranspiration. And we can understand those via the penman monteith equation, which should be the basis for modeling evapotranspiration. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, so if we combine these thermodynamic, aerodynamic considerations into a mathematical, mo mathematical model and derive it by solving the energy balance equation, we can come up with an expression for evapotranspiration. I'd like to start with a concept that I'm sure everybody here knows very well, is that the amount of water that air can hold when saturated it increases exponentially as a function of temperature. Right, there's a quasi-Squiperian relationship. There's Theoretically, it's actually called something else, right? There's different formulae that can be used to describe this line. And um, the vapor pressure deficit is the difference in the water vapor concentration in pressure terms between that much water that the atmosphere actually has and that that it could hold a saturation. That pressure deficit between what the atmosphere could have and what it does, the relative humidity, of course, is that ratio. Um, I'm bringing this up because I'd like to introduce the concept of the slope of the saturation vapor pressure function, which becomes 
importance when we are deriving the Penman-Monteith equation. So if we have um, saturated water vapor at the temperature of the atmosphere and the temperature of the surface is somewhat higher, we can, using the laws of calculus, approximate that difference, which is a curve, rather instead of a straight line, which has a slope. And then again, the vapor pressure deficit is the difference in that vapor the actual vapor pressure at some temperature minus that which the air could hold. So let's take a step back to some equations that we've seen before. We have a simplified version of the ecosystem energy balance. The latent heat is the net radiation minus soil and storage heat fluxes minus sensible heat flux. We have Fourier's law, we have fixed law, and we have a problem. That is, the surface temperature of an ecosystem can be extremely difficult to measure, and we don't want this term in the equation. This was the insight of Monteith. Uh, he used this linearization. He said that the um, vapor pressure at that surface temperature is approximately that at the temperature of air plus this slope, the slope of the saturation vapor pressure function. And right, if we're trying to simplify by removing this TS term, it didn't look like we did that at all. We just have another expression that has it. But let's take this a step further. We can reintroduce this equation, right, this approximation into our fixed law equation here, and find that we result in the definition of vapor pressure deficit right there. Right, the difference in water vapor concentration between the actual and saturated. Um, and now we still have this term. Okay, and you can notice also this TS minus TA appears in the sensible heat flux equation. So simplifying the slide to keep it away from being busy, we have now this expression for latent heat exchange and the ecosystem energy balance from before. In other words, TS minus TA is this quantity. It's the net radiation minus the soil heat flux, i.e. the available energy, minus again evapotranspiration times some term, we can reintroduce this longer equation up into here, and after some algebra, result in the Pemmonteith equation, where we have available energy, i.e. the um, diabatic terms, and then diffusion away from the surface, okay, the adiabatic terms. And what Simpler expressions of this Pemmon Monteith equation for the example that Priestley Taylor expression are doing is simply parameterizing these complicated adiabatic terms that involve more things that are difficult to measure, including the resistance of the surface to water vapor flux, the resistance of the surface to heat flux, into a single coefficient, this Priestley Taylor coefficient. And there have been some nice studies by Dennis Baldocki's group and others that demonstrate how this Priestley Taylor coefficient is changing ecosystems as a function of seasonality, because as we mentioned before, right, plants might be wanting to conserve water different times of the year, and the net radiation soil heat fluxes in principle are easier to measure, slope of the saturation vapor pressure function, that's the psychrometric constant. So that's really um, all of the talk. I guess I explained the Pemmon-Monteith equation in only five minutes, and right, we need an improved understanding of water vapor measurements. We need an improved understanding of how biology helps constrain the flux of water from surface to atmosphere. And we have many opportunities using NEON and Ameriflux and one-off eddy covariance towers that can be used to measure evapotranspiration. Also, potentially both evaporation and transpiration separately or in conjunction with sap flux or leaf level measurements or stable isotopic techniques. And um, in this new, rich, big data world that is either just a cliche or actually something extremely powerful and useful, we have the opportunity to integrate surface atmosphere exchanges of water with stream flow, with groundwater flow, with observations of changes in storage in the soil moisture and the like to really understand the water cycle at scales from site to continent to globe going forward into the future. So that is all for the presentation, and thank you very much for your time. All right, thanks, Paul. That was a great presentation, and um, we have time for some questions. Um,
All right, we have our first question, and I'm just going to uh, uh, re-articulate this for anyone who maybe can't see the slides or the chat. But it says, you briefly mentioned the penman monteith approach may not work best sometimes. Could you please expand on that a little more? The, um, I think what I was referring to there, and, and uh, I'm trying to recall when I might have actually said that, is um, it's, it's difficult to measure the resistance of the surface to water vapor heat fluxes. And the reason for that is you have the sum of resistances between the uh, leaf and the atmosphere via the stomatal resistance, and you have an additional resistance from the leaf boundary layer to the free atmosphere, and then you have an additional resistance term from the, uh, the atmosphere about the leaf to the point where you're actually making those measurements, um, in this case, the eddy covariance uh, system. So in other words, to use the Penn-Monteith equation, you need to know how every little stomata is working in aggregate. And that's hard to do, and that's why there's simplifications. So I'm hoping that that's what I was referring to when I'm saying that the Penn-Monteith equation sometimes works. Because in theory, it always works, but in practice, Right. It, it's difficult to understand these resistance terms, especially in response to limited water availability or extreme events or other transients where a lot of the steady state assumptions that we use with respect to especially this to bottle conductance might not be safe assumptions. All right. Uh, there's a an, uh, uh, next question is uh, in some eddy covariance uh, ET data sets, there are unexpectedly high ET readings during storm events. During storms, there may be high wind speeds and large temperature gradients contributing to high ET. But is there a way to be sure that these readings are not due to storm-induced fluctuations in water vapor concentration, which mm. may have nothing to do with phase change of liquid water? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so something I didn't really go into is there are many reasons when you have, I hope people can see me flipping back up here. Um, oh, let's go. Sorry, I flipped too much. If you have a sonic anemometer in the ap right, sitting in the atmosphere and it is relying on the speed of sound through the atmosphere to make a measurement, now that that optic that path is blocked when you have rain events, and so that's a huge challenge for eddy covariance is understanding what's happening during periods when the data quality is very low, when you have big raindrops that are keeping that sonic pulse from reaching its destination, and also if you have an open path infrared gas analyzer, right? That water is a direct physical block in that optical path. So um, the short answer is um, also, right, depending on the situation, we've been doing a lot of work in Brazil where you have these huge downdrafts that are associated with a lot of ozone transport and these enormous mesoscale convective storms. Thinking back again to the eddy covariance assumptions of no advective vertical transports, Oftentimes during storms, you have substantial vertical transport. So, you know, with that being said, if conditions are right, which can be characterized by the sonic anemometer, um, right, to, to, and, and uh, to understand if the turbulence, the characteristics of turbulence uh, are, or if the vertical wind velocity is low, you, you're basically thresholding out the bad values. Now, that's not a very satisfying answer because most of the time during a rain event, the quality of the flux measurements is not that great for the for the above reasons. Um, that being said, there are certain times when it actually could be working quite well, but you're right. If you have um, situations with extremely high ET, that, that might be more to do with instrumental errors than something that's actually happening. Especially okay, great. Yeah, hope that that's okay answer. I think so. And uh, we got a comment. Uh, thank you for presenting relatively new methods to petitions to model transpiration and soil evaporation. And I, I know personally that that's, that's been a big challenge in the field. And then we also got a, a thank you from the uh, the person who asked the last question, Hussein. Um, we have multiple folks typing, uh, so it looks like we have lots, lots of questions. Okay, uh, let's see. In the slide about partitioning transpiration from bare soil evap, uh, yeah. I did not understand the middle subfigure. Why would bare soil evaporation be associated with carbon flux, or did I totally misunderstand? Uh, 
Yeah, no, this is why. Um, yeah, it's um, maybe I should have focused more on this because it's an extremely exciting method, and it's the one that um, I'm working on developing a little bit more uh, during this fellowship I have in Germany. We're actually kind of leaving tomorrow um, to Germany eventually after a couple weeks. Uh, that okay. So what's happening here? Right, we have a situation of soil evaporation, and you have transport of water vapor and CO2 as a gas at the same time. Um, so if you have soil respiration, that is associated with evaporation. So you have carbon losses that are associated with those water losses if you're not going through the stomata. Again, you know, the stomata can open and very little uptake could occur for different reasons. But right, these are these kind of end members. Um, so yes, the reason is if you have simultaneous soil respiration and evaporation, you have uh, a line that looks the opposite, that middle middle subplot F. That's a figure straight from Scanlon and Kustis, which I ha which I really recommend. Um, it's a great paper, and for some reason it has not been cited quite nearly as much as I feel it should be because it's it's a valid method that is, has a strong theoretical basis. What people are trying to do is understand these situations where you can use these high frequency data for a good estimate of the total surface atmosphere exchange also with sites that have a relatively simple water use efficiency. So it works well for some sites. Um, Todd certainly demonstrated that. And there's been a number of papers these past two years that have emphasized the importance of partitioning transpiration and evaporation. There's Desesco, there's one by Schlesinger Desesco, there's one by um, a Dutch group, uh, a, a, a number of studies demonstrating divergent estimates of evaporation and transpiration, and therefore also the need to better constrain our estimates of these important things. Okay, so um, just real quick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, skip to a follow-up question on that, and I think just for clarification, uh, it says, okay, so the point is that CO2 and H2 are in the same direction uh, and sense from bare soil, but opposite direction sense for stomatal processes. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of a yes or no question. Um, yes, it would be the opposite of stomatal processes. Okay. So you have okay. water going out in both circumstances, but you have water going, or carbon going in in the open stomata. And, and water going out. Water going out in the non-stomatal case. Okay. Uh, so great. Next out, question. Carbon, yeah. Could you could you please comment a bit on the effect of landscape heterogeneity on energy balance closure? Mm -hmm. Is the closure worse for smaller patches? Is it due to advection of energy from one patch, um, say forest and pasture patches? So yeah, what where yeah. is there any clue as to the, the variability in that? So that's a figure that I didn't really show. That was one of the outcomes of that 2013 Ag and Forest in that paper that I discussed that has those sort of flux net wide energy balance closure numbers. Um, one of the leading explanations, and it's not a complete explanation we know, is that there are some complicated mesoscale motions, some large, huge regional eddies, if you will, that are you know characteristic um, length scales in the vertical direction on the order of a kilometer or two. Uh, i.e. the size of the atmospheric boundary layer, the height of it, and characteristic horizontal directions of more than that, i.e. these big elliptical type motions that are creating circumstances where there's small downdrafts that can't be measured. Right? If we're always talking about the surface heating and then air rising, well, there has to be air coming from somewhere to replace that. And uh, that's that's difficult. The, the argument is that there's something about more heterogeneous ecosystems, either in plant functional type or surface heating or something, that is contributing preferentially to these mesoscale motions that people believe might be causing part of this lack of closure in the anti-covariance energy balance. It's an indirect line of inference, to be sure. But what we did in the paper was used modus observations and quantified different matrices of heterogeneity, either in plant functional type or in vegetation indices like the enhanced vegetation index or the NDVI, and found that there was a significant relationship between variability of those quantities and energy balance closure. So 
the suggestion, of course, is that we would need likewise a mechanistic understanding of the drivers of these mesoscale motions that are causing a situation where the assumptions of the decovariance method are not perfect. Now, nobody believes that these assumptions that we're making this weather assumptions, right, that you can understand the mass flux of a quantity by putting some sensors in the air, measuring changes in storage under that sensor for the purposes of understanding entire surface atmosphere exchange, um, and then also parameterizations to improve the closure or methods to quantify and characterize these events that are that are turbulent, but they're seen from the perspective of eddy covariance as being advective. We, this, this, that, this is a W bar that you can't quite measure, in effect. Um, my colleague Matthias Mauder has a number of papers on this topic, as do others, um, that are really trying to couple an improved understanding of atmospheric flows with the eddy covariance system um, to better measure exchanges at the surface. So it's, it's in many ways, in my opinion, an area of active research. Great. Um, so next question, and I think this is still referring to the, uh, the triplet of figures on the current uh -huh. slide, but where's the water use efficiency coming from this figure, and what assumptions uh, were made regarding the other covariants, such as light levels? Yes, okay, that is a great question, um, and in fact, it is one of the reasons I was able to be awarded this fellowship in Germany. Um, the water use efficiency in the original uh, formulation was kind of approximated. You can, you can use um, different closure models, right, like the Ball-Berry model, to better understand the carbon dioxide concentration inside the leaf, which is necessary to understand the water use efficiency. And so you can measure water use efficiency using, you know, your isotopic techniques or your leaf level measurements. And then at the same time, why are you bothering with this Scanlon and Kousis partitioning method if you have observations of those other things? So um, what I'm trying to do is basically add different models that can be used to calculate water use efficiency in conjunction with this model, which is based ultimately on Mona Nubukov's similarity theory by Scanlon and Kustis for the purpose of better quantifying this water use efficiency, because that is, yes, you need to know water use efficiency to use the approach, and you can do so either using measurements or further models. So um, it's really an excellent question. The answer is um, you need to do some more work. So it's not a limitation um, of the approach per se, I feel. Um, rather, it's an opportunity to in inject some more um, more theory about how plants work into this approach to partition, transpiration, and evaporation. Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, so we have a question now. Uh, Williams et al. from Water Resources Research studied global flux net data and found that grasslands have a 9% higher evaporative fraction than forests. A surprising uh -huh. result. Is there a possible bias from eddy covariance approach that may be causing this result? So there's more evaporative fraction over grasslands than forests, right? There's fewer um, resistances in the grass to water exchange, yet there are more resistances between the grass surface and the atmosphere to water exchange than there is from the forest to the atmosphere. This is this decoupling coefficient from Jarvis and McNaughton, right? So you have um, plants that, like trees, where there are more resistances within the tree, yet less resistances in the atmosphere, and then you have grasses where there are fewer resistances within the plant and more resistances to the atmosphere. Um, I don't really think necessarily, it, it's an interesting question, is it bias? Because as you noted from that flux net figure, there's a very strong temperate zone bias, as we oftentimes have, uh, in our global measurement strategy. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you have a forest and you have more leaves, then you'd have more evaporating surface, so I'd assume more evapotranspiration. Um, the the other thing, the other confounder, of course, as we've been talking about, is the energy balance closure, which actually tends to be about the amongst trees and grasses. So it's probably not a problem with that. Um, I don't know the paper. I'd like to take a look at it, but there's reasons to believe that you know, depending on the circumstance, right? Grasses have more evaporation or trees have more, depending on where the resistances to water transport from soil to atmosphere reside. 
Okay, great. Bit. And uh, and I had noticed. I think the I bias addressed the question well. instead of answered it. <laughs> well, yeah, it and I, I think that's I think that's pretty typical for for this field still at this point for for certain questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have uh, Shannon is typing again, um, and she says thank you very much. Um, I think that's it for questions, and we're, we're right at 4 o'clock right now, so um, I guess, Emily, um, do we want to start wrapping up? Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess if anyone else has a final question and they want to type it in real quick, um, go for it. Otherwise, we're right at 4 o'clock, so... We and I, and uh, we just will remind you that the um, the uh, website for the presentation uh, the presentation will be posted as all or all the cyber seminars on the Quasi website and Emily posted that earlier. Um, but you know, please take a look at those. And uh, I hope for you you all that have joined us for all five of the talks in the series, or, or at least the majority of them, that um, that you enjoyed the series and. Uh, hopefully uh, uh, got something out of it um, one way or another. So uh, thank you very much for joining. Thanks yeah, again for the invitation. And Paul, thank you for presenting today. And, and Stephen, thank you for hosting over the duration of the series. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, Paul, you know, I, th I do think you were a great way to kind of round out the series. Uh, we, we heard from a, uh, a bunch of other folks that were focused on either the stream flow aspect of it or, or the uh, individual components, whether it be SAP flux or, evapor uh, or, or evaporation from interception. And I think hearing, hearing the, uh, the kind of basic review and plus synthesis that you gave today was, was a great way to round it out. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for everybody for, uh, for chiming in as well and for some great questions. All right, great. Well, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off. It looks All like right. <laughs> that's it. So All right. thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank and um, we will have another cyber seminar series in the fall. So look for information about that to be coming out later in the year. Great. And have a great weekend, too. All right. Yeah, thank you, you too. too. Take care. Bye.